Uh, good afternoon, everybody. A pleasure to welcome you and uh, on behalf of Tor Motion and Rebecca Winter, Dr. Rebecca Winter. She allows me to call her that. Um, uh, Rebecca, this is uh, um, a pleasure to have her. Re Rebecca, we've known for many, many years. She grew up, of course, uh, not of course, but she grew up a, a few blocks away from where we live in, in Toronto. Is And uh, she actually taught um, when we started the Matan Bat Mitzvah program. Going back how many years? 10, 11 years at least. At mm -hmm, least. Mm -hmm. Rebecca was at our least. first teacher. Wonderful. She's a wonderful teacher, as you'll hear. Uh, she taught here in Opana in Toronto. She's taught in the um, Atlanta in the school. She's uh, learned at Matan, at, um, at Lindenbaum, and in, in the GPATS program at Stern. And uh, she has a PhD in, neuro, in neuropsychology, which is where she's basically working now in, in private practice. So it's really uh, covers all the fields and it's a pleasure to welcome her. And uh, from Atlanta, we like when she comes to visit in Toronto once in a while. So it's at least now. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a long time since you've been here. I know of like everybody, yeah. everybody. Okay, Bakashan, it was actually Rebecca's idea to sort of do this series as a, a joint series, her and her Chavrusa, and Jennifer Raskis, who taught last week and will teach next week, and then Rebecca will teach, okay, two weeks is Erev Rosh Hashanah, but it'll be in three weeks she'll teach. So we're doing this sort of joint series on um, tshuva in Tanakh, and today, Menashe, because he needed a lot of tshuva, because I, I guess we're still here, right? Okay, I was in 52 years of doing harab Nei Hashem, got to do a lot of tshuva for that. Vakasha, Rebecca. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be back with Tara Motion. Thank you for this opportunity, Rabbi Kelvin, as always. Um, and it is an honor to be teaching this series along with my friend, um, Jen Raskis. And I know a lot of you tuned into her wonderful sheer last week. So um, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, fantastic. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, so that you can see the sources that we'll be going through today. Um, hang on one second. Okay. And like Rabbi Kelman said, we are going to be talking about Menashe the king. Um, some of you may be very familiar with Menashe, others not, but we're going to be doing a little bit of a deep dive into who Menashe was and his story and how, like Rabbi Kelman said, his story really leaves us in want or in need of doing shuva. So the King Menashe, complete repentance or self-preservation is what I've called it. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to turn to the Rambam in Hilfot Shuva and Perak Zayin, where um, the Rambam discusses, and I'll read the English, he says, because every man was endowed with free will, as we have elucidated, um, every man should strive to repent, to confess his sins by word of mouth, to dust off his hands from his sins as preparation for death after repentance, so he may acquire life in the world to come, so he may require olam haba. And as we'll see as we talk about Menashe, um, the, the real question that emerges for Menashe or about Menashe's life is if we really feel that he was even Zaha for Olam Haba, if he was, um, if he merited any, the world to come. And we'll talk about that together. So just to keep this Rambam in the back of our minds as we explore the story of Menashe. So before we delve into Menashe, I'm just pulling up a quick map. I'm very fond of these maps. So a quick map of the time period that we're talking about. We're around the time of probably about 690 BCE, so before the Common Era. Um, this is the time period before Horban by Rishon, before the destruction of the first temple. Um, and this is the time period of the kings, the Melachim. And so just a quick recap that the Melachim, the kings were divided into two separate parts, two separate components following some very interesting stories at the beginning of Sefer Melachim Aleph. Um, and the kingdom was essentially divided through the middle of Eretz Yisrael, as you can see on the map through that blue line, into the northern kingdom, which was known as Malchu Yisrael, and the southern kingdom, which was known as Mal Malchu Yehuda. And Malchu Yisrael, the kingdom of Israel, was destroyed or dispersed by Ashur, 
um, um, in what was called Galut Shamron, the exile of Samaria, which was the capital of Israel, of uh, Malchut Israel. And so the time period that we're talking about with Menashe is actually after Galut Shamron. So after the Northern Kingdom has already broken up and the people have been dispersed throughout different lands or they moved south to Yehuda, we're talking about a time period where the Northern part of Israel is really completely inactive. So nothing is really going on during this time up, up there. Um, so Menasha was the king of Yehuda. He's the 14th king in the reign of Yehuda. So this is after the exile of Shamran. And something notable about Menashe is that he is the King Chizkiyahu's son. So his father, Hamela Chizkiyahu, was famously known as returning, bringing back B'nai Israel to worshiping in the Beit HaMikdash um, and all that, all that went along with that. So really helping B'nai Israel, helping the Jewish people return to God as before him, Bnei Israel were really worshiping other gods or worshiping God in improper ways outside of the Beit HaMikdash. So it will be interesting for us to see how Menashe continues his father's wonderful, um, illustrious legacy. It's Zephyr Malachim Bet, and we'll re I'll read the story out loud and pause if there are any questions. All right. Ben Shemestre Shana Menashe the Malcha. So Menashe was 12 years old when he took over the reign. The Chamishim Chamesh Shana Malach Yerushalayim Shemi Malchesiva. So Menashe was 12 years old. He reigned for 55 years. I like to say that a full reign or a full uh, generation is about 40 years. So Menashe got 55 years of his reign, which is quite a very, very long time. Um, but Vayas Hara Bene Hashem, he was not a good king. So right off the bat, we see he's not really following in his father, Chizkiah, who's footsteps. Ketoavot Hagoyim Asher Harish Hashem Ipnei Israel. So he's following the other nations around him. Vayashav Vayiven at Habamot Asher Ibad Chizkiah Aviv. So he rebuilds the altars that his father, Chizkiah, had gotten rid of. So he's reintroducing Avodah um, Zarah. He's reintroducing idol worship into Bnei Israel. So he's not just doing this outside the Beit Hamikdash, but inside the Beit Hamikdash as well. Let's continue a little bit with our uh, with Menashe. So he builds these altars for all different types of Avodah Zarah within the two courts of the Beit HaMikdash. And then he engages in what's known as the horrible form, horrific form of Avodah Zarah of Molech, where people would take their children, their sons, and pass them through the fire, killing their children as a form of sacrifice to the gods. Um, so he consulted with Av and Yedoni, these ghosts, which is um, not permitted. Um, everything he did was to anger God. And it goes on to describe that he again puts these um, puts these on, um, excuse me, puts these idols into the Beit HaMikdash. All right. Um, so let's, I'll just skip that, the next part because it's just describing more of the same, how he desecrates the Beit HaMikdash. And so as we would expect, Hashem has a reaction to Menashe. So Hashem sends a nevuah. He sends a prophecy through the Nevi'im to Menashe saying, Ya'an asher asa Menashe melech Yehuda ha'toivod ha'ela. Because Menashe did this, he'rami kol asher asu ha'emori asher lefanav. Even worse than some of the other nations like the Amori that did before him. Vayachti gam et Yehuda b'klulav. And he also brought Bnei Yisrael, brought Yehuda to sin. Lachen kol amar Hashem elokei Yisrael. Hineni mevi ra'a al Yerushalayim b'Yehuda asher kol shama tat. I'm going to bring terrible things to Yehuda. Anyone who hears it, their ears are going to ring. 
ונתתי על ירושלים את קו שומרון ואת מסגלות בית אחיו, ומחיתי את ירושלים כאשר ימחד הצלחת מחה והפך את פניה. So I'm going to wipe out Yerushalayim, just like somebody would wipe clean a plate. Like very interesting imagery. ונתתי את שארית נחלתי ונתתים ביד אויביהם, והיו לבד ולמתיסה לכל אויביהם. And I'm going to allow their enemies to plunder them. Yan asher asu et harab e'nai, ve'yu mach ichim oti min hayom asher yatsu avatam yitzrayim v'at hayom azeh. So, so says Hashem, because of what Menashe did, essentially that's what's going to bring about Horban Habay. That's what's going to bring about the destruction of Yerushalayim because of all the horrific, horrible things that Menashe did. And the Tanakh actually continues, even after Hashem tells this to Menashe and to Bnei Yisrael, the Tanakh then adds on one more extra terrible thing that Menashe did. V'dam nati shafaf Menashe. V'gam dam nati shafaf Menashe. Not only did Menashe do all those terrible things, horrible forms of Avodah Zarah, desecrating the house of Hashem, killing his own children, but he also put many innocent people to death. He also killed innocent people. Harbe me'od. Ad asher mi le'e et Yerushalayim te'lape lavad mi chatata asher achiyat yudala asad hara. So even over and above the other sins, he also killed innocent people so that he filled Yerushalayim with blood and with bodies. So really just through and through a horrible, truly horrific king. And as we would expect, the Gemara in Sanhedrin jumps on Manasseh and says that Menashe is one of only three kings who did not merit Olam Haba, who did not merit the world to come. The first being Yeravam ben Nevat, who was responsible, at least partially, for the division of the Malucha, for the division of the kingdom. The second being Ahav, who we're not going to talk about now, but is considered one of the worst kings of Israel when Israel was, was active. He was one of the worst kings of the northern tribes. And finally, Menashe. And the Gemara in Sanhedrin says, Ma Achav ein la chalak la olam haba. Just like Achav did not get a chalak in olam haba, he did not merit the world to come. Af Menashe ein la chalak la olam haba. So too, Menashe does not have a, a piece or a place in the world to come. And of course, this makes sense to us, I think, having read what we just read, this horrible, truly terrible king, no moral values, um, he does not merit the world to come. So I think so far so good about Menashe, and hopefully people are scratching their heads and thinking, what does this have to do with Shuva at all? Um, but you will see in just one second as we move on with Menashe. Now, the story of Menashe is also brought, um, revisited in one other area of Tanakh called Dibre Hayamim. And Dibre Hayamim chronicles is, um, sorry, did someone have something to say? Keep going. Um, the Rei Hayamim Chronicles is a book that really is the last book of the Tanakh. So it's the last book of Ketuvim at the very, very end of Tanakh. And it reviews um, really a history of Bnei Israel, starting all the way from Adam, Shet, and Nosh. So all the way, way back to Adam, and ends off um, at the time period where Bnei Israel are returning to Eretz Israel from Galut Bavel, from the exile of Babylon, to rebuild the second temple. So Dibre Hayamim really goes through many of the stories and retells many of the stories, and it retells our story of Menashe. And we're going to read that story together to see if there are any differences between the stories of Menashe as he was presented in Sefer Malachim, and Menashe as he's presented in Divre Hayamim. So let's read it quickly together. Hopefully you'll notice the similarities at first. Then, So Menashe, again, was 12 years old. 55 years. So far, so good. Right, he does very terrible things. Um, so he brings these altars and he returns all the terrible things that his father had abolished, had, had gotten rid of. Um, 
So again, introducing idol worship into the Beit HaMikdash sounds good so far. And again, who ha'avir et banav ba'esh b'gei ben chinam. So he passes his son through the fire, engaging in malach. So far, again, so far, so good. Ba'asem et hesel ha'semel asher asabah ve'et alakim. Again, so he's introducing this idol worship. And he, um, he does all these terrible things. I won't read it completely fully, but really it does a good job of, I think, capturing, uh, you can read it for yourself a little bit, but really capturing the gist of what Malachim was trying to tell us about Menashe and about his sin. Then Sefer Dibre Hayamim continues and says, Vayidaber Hashem el Menashe ve'elama v'lo hikshivu. So it tells us that Hashem first tries to talk to Menashe, the Elama, and to Bnei Israel, the Lahik Shiva, but they did not listen. Okay. And then it says, Vayave Hashem Alehem et Sareha Tsava Asher Lamelach Ashur. And Hashem brings upon them the, um, the officers of the army of the king of Ashur, Vayokadu et Menashe Bakuchim, and they took him captive, they uh, bound him up and they took him captive, Vaya Astruhu Banachusha Taim. So they, they, um, they bind him up and they take him off to Babel. And when he's there, when he's in Babel and in distress, presumably, we'll talk about this later, but maybe being tortured. Um, so he calls out to Hashem, his God, Elokav. And he becomes very humble before Hashem. And he dovens out to Hashem. And now Menashe knows that Hashem is God. That Hashem is God. Hashem is Elohim. So obviously, very, very different from the accounts of Melachim, where Hashem says, because of all the terrible things you did, I'm going to destroy Yerushalayim and bring about the destruction of the city of Yerushalayim. Here, we see that Menashe actually has this opportunity, and he turns back toward Hashem and does tshuva, as I say in quotations, and we'll, we'll discuss if we agree it's tshuva or not. But then, after he calls out to Hashem even more, Diver Hayamim continues. So he builds this outer wall fortifying the city of David, which could be strategic because he was just infiltrated by Ashur. Makes sense. But then, if we go to the next Pasuk 15, Vayasar et Elohe Hanechar. Then uh, Menashe comes back and he gets rid of all the foreign gods. He takes them all out of Beit Hashem. And he rebuilds the Mizbeach of Hashem. Um, he tells Yehuda, come back, come serve Hashem Elokei Yisrael. Now still, aval od ha'am zavchim babamas, rach la Hashem Elokeichem. Now they're still not all, um, they're still not all worshiping in the Beit HaMikdash, which is really what we're supposed to be doing and not worshiping outside the Beit HaMikdash. But says the Tanakh, when they are worshiping outside the Beit HaMikdash, they're only worshiping to Hashem. So there's really this massive turnaround that Menashe is able to enact and influence in the nation, not just for himself, but really a national return to God. The Yeter Divrei Menashe, Utsilato, Lelaka, Vidivrei Achazim, Hamidabrim Ela, Veshem Hashem Elokei Yisrael, Hinam Al Divrei Malchei Yisrael, Yehuda. Oh, sorry, Yisrael, I couldn't see that. Utsilato, Veater La, Vekoch Atato, Malato. So every, all the, all the, um, the history of Menashe, it's recorded elsewhere. And so ends Menashe's life in Sefer Dibre Hayami. 
So obviously two very, very initially similar accounts of Manasseh's story, um, where Debra Hayamim then leads us in a very, very different direction from Sefer Malachim. So one question for you, if anyone wants to, to shout out or participate, what are your impressions of Menashe's tshuva, of Menashe's um, tshuva that's as it's expressed in Sefer Dibrehem? And if no one wants to answer, someone wants to put it in the chat, that's great. If no one wants to answer, that's fine. I can continue. Oops. I just wanted to see if anyone wrote anything in the chat. Ah, okay, someone talked about Moloch. Not everybody agrees that the worship of Moloch actually involved killing children. It may have been an initiation rite where the child was passed over through the fire and emerged alive. That's very interesting. I never actually heard of that. Um, if anyone has ever read the source, does, is anyone familiar with that book? People are nodding. Yes, excellent. There's a, there's a yes, wonderful by chapter. Yes, excellent. Um, and there's a really wonderful, uh, gruesome and difficult to read chapter in the source that really talks about this form of Abu Dazala and how it was really part of the framework of society during that time period. So I've never actually heard of that initiation, right? But you're saying, Lauren, that it was under duress. It's under duress, was it sincere? Ah, beautiful, you're talking about the tshuva. Excellent, so what Lauren is saying is that it seems that Menashe's tshuva was done under duress. So was this really sincere tshuva, says Lauren, right? How could this truly be tshuva if it was done while he was in captivity, perhaps while he was even under torture, right? How could we really consider this true tshuva? Um, but then, says Tova, um, after he was saved and came back to Israel, he did tikkun, right? So what's interesting really is that whether or not we agree it was tshuva or not, and Lauren, there will be sources to back you up. We'll get to those in a second. After he was, Hashem allows him to be saved, and then he comes back to Yerushalayim, and he is in some ways metaken his previous deeds. So it seems like regardless of whether we liked his tshuva or not, whether we think, well, you know, he was under duress, he was being tortured, I'm, I don't love his tshuva, Regardless of what we think, it's clear that Hashem gives him the opportunity, and then he takes an opportunity to turn things around. He does some tikkun, he is mitaken in at least some ways. Beautiful. I love those comments, Lauren and Tova. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to reshare my screen so that we can see just two perspectives, and I think um, Lauren maybe would like these perspectives. The first one comes from the Malbi. And the Malbim says that there's a reason why the tshuva is not talked about at all in Sefer Malachim. Why? Because it says, the gam dam nakisha fas menashe, that menashe spilled innocent blood, and shemilvad michatata asher hechtiyat Yehuda, that was separate or was different from the ways that he got in Israel to sin through Avodazara. Right? She still is sitting with the sin of Shvichutamim. And therefore, this tshuva, the reason the tshuva is not mentioned in Sefer Malachim is because no matter what, he still enacted, he still did this Shvichutamim. He still killed innocent people. And through the tshuva that he does in Sefer Dibre Hayamim, all the description, it is mitaken his deeds of Avodah Zarah. It is a tikkun really for the, um, the Avodah Zarah that he brought into the Beit HaMikdash and that he spread throughout Bnei Israel. But he was not able, and he doesn't even see that he attempted or one questions how he could really do tshuva for the Gam Dam Naki Shafach Menashe. So the Malbim is not thrilled with Menashe's tshuva. Neither is the Radak who says, yeah, im tomar v'harei Menashe asa tshuva, Moshe gatu v'dibre hayamim, right? Like we see in dibre hayamim. You may say Menashe did tshuva like he did in dibre hayamim. And then it goes through the tshuva that Menashe did in dibre hayamim that we all now know well. Efshar ki hagalut shagala Menashe 
Hayabis Kunata, the Ziknuta, right? That his um, that his galu, meaning his galu to Babel and the punishment that he got, that happened when he was old. The Achar Sha'asa Shuva Loha Erichamim Kokach. He didn't really have a lot of time left. Meaning, says the Radak, this was really like a last minute, end of life kind of shuva. So it doesn't really merit mention so much in Sefer Malachim because it was really at the last second, at the very end. I think Rabbi Kelman at the beginning of the shiur said it was, he did, there's a tradition that he did 52 years of sinning. And then maybe the last three were, um, maybe just the last three, the very, very end he of his life was shuva. And there is this tradition that I think this, the Radak is talking about here. This chuba is not great. Um, we don't want to really hang our hat on this chuba, And that's why it's not in Sefer Malachim. And maybe Lauren, what, that would resonate with Lauren. It was not great chuba. Lauren's reason was for a different reason than it was under duress. But it's really the same idea. We, we're not thrilled with this chuba. However, we can't get away from the fact that the tshuva is highlighted in Sefer Dibre Hayamim, and it is completely excluded, not, talk, not spoken about at all in Sefer Malachim, which always leaves me, when I read these different accounts of Dibre Hayamim and Malachim, I'm always left thinking to myself, well, what, what's true? Like, what actually happened? Did Menashe do tshuva? or didn't he do tshuva? This is pretty, it's like really a binary choice, right? What actually happened? What's the actual story? And Rabbi Chaim Angel really loves, loves to grapple with this question as well. And I really enjoy what he says. He often says that when we are faced with differences in the Tanakh like this, where there are radically different accounts of the same story, we never should ask ourselves what actually happened. Rather, we should ask, why is the author trying to portray the story in this way? Meaning the author of Sefer Melachim is trying to give us, pass us a message by deliberately excluding the Menashe's tshuva from the narrative in Melachim. And the author of Dibre HaYamim is trying to give a very different message when they highlight and include Menashe's tshuva in Sefer Dibre Hayamim. And so in order to fully understand the message behind these two forms of these two ways of viewing Menashe's life, we really have to understand these two authors. So I brought the Gemara, the famous Gemara in Baba Batra, that gives us really our tradition of authorship of the Nevim and Ketuvim in the Torah. And I won't go through everything, um, of course, but we'll look just at Malachim and Dibir Hayamim. And according to our tradition, Yirmiyahu wrote Sefer Malachim. So says at the top, Yirmiyahu Katab Sifra, he wrote his own book, Sefer Yirmiyahu, the Sefer Malachim, the Kinot. Okay, so he writes these books, Yirmiyahu writes, is in, according to our tradition, writes Sefer Malachim. Sefer Dibre Hayamim is written, we said at the beginning at a very different time period, written by Ezra, Ezra Katab Sifra, the Yachas Shel Dibre Hayamim Adla, and the parts of Dibre Hayamim that pertain to him and to his life, and Nehemiah at the very, at the very, very end, Uman Aske Nehemiah Ben Chachalia, right? So uh, Nehemiah writes the parts of Dibre Hayamim that really pertain to him and his life following Ezra's rule. So Ezra Nehemiah, according to our tradition, writes Sefer Dibre Hayamim, and Yirmiyahu writes Sefer Malachim. And these two, um, these two leaders, these two groups of leaders, come from radically different perspectives. They are living in completely different time periods, and their perspectives are very, very different. So I want to turn your attention just to one piece of Yirmiyahu, just to understand where Yirmiyahu is coming from and what is motivating Yirmiyahu. What is the message that Yirmiyahu is trying to give to his, um, to the people who are listening to him? And I pulled from Parak Um, This is one example, a taste of Yirmiyahu, but I think this really high, this really showcases a lot about what Yirmiyahu is about. Vayomer Hashem Eloi. Hashem says to me, Im Yamod Moshe Ushmuel 
אין נפשי על העם הזה, שלח נא על פניו ואצלו. אז סז ירמיה, היא סז, השם סד תמי, even if Moshe and Shmuel, even if these great Nevi'im, these great leaders of Am Yisrael, who are close to Hashem and who Hashem trusts and loves, even if they were to intercede on B'nai Yisrael's behalf, none, I would still not be won over by them. Meaning, nonetheless, I will still destroy Yerushalayim and the Beit HaMikdash because of the sins of Am Yisrael. Yirmiyahu's entire thesis, Yirmiyahu's entire, um, the, his thrust, his, uh, the reason really for his book and the point of his books that he writes, both Yirmiyahu and Sefer Melachim, are trying to make both B'nai Israel on the ground during his time, as well as the reader understand the severity of the sins of B'nai Israel that led us to the destruction of the first state Hamikdash. that led us to Chorban Habayit. And anything that sways in any direction away from that is going to interfere with Yirmiyahu's message. Yirmiyahu does this time and time again. We see that Yirmiyahu highlights the sins of Am Yisrael, of Yehuda, whenever possible, so that we can fully understand and appreciate why and what brought about the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash. Yirmiyahu even highlights sins as far, far back as um, in Mitzrayim and Galut Mitzrayim and the, and the sins of the Midbar. And he says that really for all of history, we were kind of leading up to this pinnacle, this destruction. But Yirmiyahu, of course, has very special, special place in his heart for Menashe. And in our parrot that we have over here in the highlight at the bottom, he says, and really, why is this all going to happen? Because of Menashe. Menashe was as bad as everything was. Menashe was just the worst. And because of Menashe, that's what's really jump-starting, and that's what's really hastening the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash. For Yirmiyahu, the... Introducing, excuse me, introducing Menashe's tshuva detracts from his overall message of the, the why Bnei Israel deserve this punishment of the destruction of Yehuda. And that's really Yirmiyahu's message. I want us to now turn to Ezra and Nehemiah, and I brought us from, from Nehemiah. But Nehemiah and Ezra and Nehemiah are living in a completely different time period, as we mentioned. It's the time period of Shivat Zion. coming back after the Chorban Bayit Rishon, after the exile of the Jews to Babel, Ezra and Achemia are talking about a time period where they're trying to convince Bnei Israel to come back to Yerushalayim to start rebuilding the Second Temple. And they're having a very hard time. As you can imagine, the Jewish people in Babel were becoming comfortable in Babel, as many of us are, now some of us are in Israel, But, you know, I'm comfortable here in Atlanta, but many of us are comfortable outside of Eretz Yisrael. And so, too, the Jews of Babel were also comfortable outside of Eretz Yisrael. But an, another layer to add to this is that many of the Jews of Babel that Ezra and Achemia were dealing with at that time were also very unaffiliated, meaning they had lost many of the core principles that really uphold our religion, some of which are keeping Shabbat. Um, intermarriage. And that was really rampant throughout the communities of Babel that um, Ezra and Achemia were leading. Even when they led some of a small amount of Jews back to Eretz Yisrael, those Jews were still very distant from practicing many of the core values of Judaism. And so Ezra and Achemia write very, very differently from Yirmiyahu. As you can see at the beginning here, I have Nehemiah Peregud Gimel 13. Um, Nehemiah says, Zachrali elokai al zot ve'al temach chasadai. Hashem, please remember the good things that I did, asher asiti bevet elokai mishmarav. Remember the good things that I did because I'm about to talk about some of the sins of Bnei Israel right now. But while I talk about these sins, I'm starting off my nebuah, I'm starting off my parak by saying, remember the good, Hashem. Don't forget the bad 
don't remember just the bad things that we're doing. Please, Hashem, also remember the good. And then he goes in to talk about the problems of Shabbat and intermarriage. And then Nehemiah even brings up, um, he even brings up Melach Shlomo. He says, Halo al ele chatash lamo in the bold. Al ele chatash lamo melach Israel. Uvagoyim harabim la hayamelach tamohu. So even though Shlomo, who was one of our greatest kings of Bnei Israel, of a united Am Israel, even he sinned, says Nehemiah. So please, Hashem, please also remember that we did good things in spite of the bad things that we did. In understanding this perspective of Ezra and Nehemiah, we can now understand how they wrote Divrei Hayamim. For Ezra and Nehemiah, any opportunity to highlight even a small level of tshuva, even introducing a little bit of gray into what otherwise might be considered a truly evil or black character, um, we're introducing just a little bit of gray into that character trait in order to tell Bnei Israel. It's true that you have sinned, but look at Menashe. He sinned, but he still did Shuba and Hashem did respond in some way to Menashe. Hashem gave him an opportunity. If Menashe can do it, you can definitely do it, right? That is the message that Ezra and Nehemiah want to give to Am Yisrael at that time period. They want to give them the, they want to give them the message of you can do Shuba. We can, you can return. Even if the worst can do it, surely you can do this too. You're not killing anybody. Intermarriage is not as bad. Please, you can also do tshuva. Now, I'm going to pause here for a second because I see I have a few, um, a few comments. Beautiful. Beautiful. That's true. Um, another possibility. Where? Sorry, I'm going to start from the top here. Um, okay. Sivan says another possibility is that Chronicles shows a tendency to soften the kings. Exactly, yes. And that I think is what we said, um, is that we said here, that right, that the that Dibra Hayamim kind of brings in this gray into the king. Sivan, thank you. Maybe you wrote that while I was saying that. So does Radak have sources for his reading um, that it happened at the very end of his life? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that question, actually. I'll leave it. Maybe Rabbi Kalman knows that answer. Um, Sivan says this variation also occurs in the accounts of Shlomo's kingship in Kings and uh, in Malachim and Dibir Hayami. Excellent. What we're talking about, we're looking at one story of differences between Malachim and Dibir Hayami, but there are many, many, many stories just like this, where Malachim and Dibir Hayami differ in these core ways. And I think the thesis that we've come up with, with the authorship thesis, we could say, Yirmiyahu versus Ezra Nehemiah, works very well for any of these differences, even though we're just focusing on this one for looking at this aspect of Shiva. Um, is there a difference between right and authorship? Um, tradition, I'm, I'll come back to that. I'm not sure who wrote that question. I don't fully understand this. Um, Okay. Okay. Um, excellent. Okay. Well, excellent. I like these comments. I'll come back to them a little bit at the end, if that's okay with everybody. Beautiful. So let's come back to this. All right. So this is Ezra and Achemia. They're really seeking and they're really hanging on to almost this radical form of forgiveness, this radical form of forgiveness from Hashem, even in the face of this true evil of Menashe. And in order to really understand the way that the Yerushalmi, the way the Gemara Yerushalmi looks at this form of forgiveness, Yerushalmi really shows us how, according to one perspective, Menasha, maybe Lauren will like this, um, how Menasha's tshuva really was so inauthentic and nonetheless Hashem still forgave Menasha. And I'll read the Yerushalmi to you. Yerushalmi says, Rabbi Levi said, um, the Ashurim, the, the Syrians, filled a copper cauldron and placed Menashe in it and lit a fire under it. When he saw his plight, so they're torturing him. When he saw his plight, he called out to every idolatrous deity. When none assisted him, he said, remember that my father read me a verse in shul, in synagogue. 
when you are in distress and all these things befall you in later days, latter days, you shall return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. He will not fail you and he will not destroy you. Now I cry out to God, says Manasseh. If he listens to me, well and good. If not, then all kinds of gods are alike. So really a very, very tepid kind of tshuva, right? This is really like the most busy Eved kind. He's tried calling out to all his other gods. And only then, says the Gemara, is Menasha turning to Hashem because he remembers something that his father, Chizkiah, who said. The angels barricaded the windows of heaven that the prayer of Menasha would not ascend to God. And they said, Lord of the world, are you willing to give gracious hearing to one who has worshipped idols and set up an idol in the temple? And I would add, killed so many people, right? Um, are you willing to give this hearing? Are you willing to accept this man's shuva? And Hashem says, if I did not accept the penance of this man, replied God, I should be closing the door in the face of all repentant sinners. Hashem made a small opening under the throne of his glory and received the prayer of Menashe through it. And so Hashem says, I have to, because I feel cornered into this, I feel like I have to accept this man's prayer. And so he allows this, he allows Menashe's prayer really just to creep in under his throne. Almost like the Gemara is saying, it wasn't an acceptance in the way that Hashem was thrilled or that he was accepting Menashe face on or head on, but he allows the tshuva to kind of sneak in under his throne. And that's how he accepts his tshuva. So very much goes along with what Ezra and Echemi are saying that even the most evil of people, they, if he could do tshuva, then surely we can do tshuva. But it really, really shows us an aspect of tshuva that probably at least I am, there's discomfort for the, about this shuva. There's something uncomfortable about this type of acceptance of shuva. Accepting the shuva of a person who is a true sinner, and then even when faith went under true duress, even when being tortured, the first thing he thinks of is not turning to Hashem, but turning to other idols and to other gods. And only then, when he's really backed into a corner, does he turn to Hashem. Still, says the Rishalmi, that is still a form of tshuva that Hashem accepts, probably it seems in a bidyevet, in a secondary kind of way, as it sneaks under the throne. Now, I'm not the only one who's uncomfortable with this kind of tshuva. We're going to revisit our initial Gemara in Sanhedrin that said that Menashe did not merit a place in the world to come. Rabbi Yehuda then comes and says, Menashe has a share in the world to come, right? We initially said Menashe does not have a share in the world to come. Rabbi Yehuda says Menashe does have a share in the world to come. As it is stated, and he prayed to him, he was entreated of him, and he heard his supplication, brought him back to Yerushalayim into his kingdom. Like it says in our parak in Jibre Hayami. Rabbi Yochanan said, and both of them, Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis who disagree with regard to whether Menashe has a share in the world to come, interpreted one in the same verse as it is stated, and I will make them into a horror for all the kingdoms of the earth on account of Menashe ben Chizkiyahu. Just like Yirmiyahu says that because of Menashe ben Chizkiyahu, I'm going to bring this horrible thing to Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda says that on account of Menashe means that the Jewish people will be judged harshly as ultimately one as wicked as Menashe repented and they did not do so. So says Rabbi Yehuda, oh, he says, well, Menashe repented, but even though Menashe repented, Bnei Israel did not do so, says Rabbi Yehuda, even though that doesn't seem to jive with the actual text, which says that Menashe brought the people back to Hashem. And one says, the rabbis hold that on account of Menashe means because he did not repent, and the people followed in his footsteps. So the second opinion is, well, Menashe really did not repent. And therefore, the meaning would be that he did not merit in Chelat Lo'olam Haba. He does not merit in a place of the world to come. And the people followed in his footsteps. Rabbi Yochanan then says, anyone who says that Menashe has no share in the world to come 
discourages people from doing shuvah, discourages penitence, as Menasha repented, and according to them is nevertheless excluded from the world to come. So says Rabbi Yochanan, we have to, even though we're uncomfortable with it, we have to say Menasha merits a place in the world to come. Otherwise, we're discouraging people from doing shuva, which is what our Gemara in um, the Yerushalmi was saying as well. We have to encourage people to do shuva, and therefore, we must accept Menashe's uh, repentance, and therefore, he does merit a place in the world to come. Do I hear, do I hear a comment? Okay. No. All right, beautiful. Um, now, again, I'll go back to sharing my screen. Now, again, this is a, the reason that this is a machloket in the Gemara, I think, in Sanhedrin, is because it's unclear, it's so uncomfortable. On one hand, how can we say that someone does not merit a place in the world to come if they do some kind of tshuva, even if it's the kind of tshuva that Menashe did? Like Ezra Nechemer, we want to really believe that anybody can come back. But then there's that lingering question, is that true? Can anybody come back? Anybody? Somebody as horrible and as evil as Menashe, can he really come back? Which brings us to the Yirmiyahu perspective. It's not even worth talking about Menashe's tshuva because it's not, he was not worthy of tshuva. And regardless of his tshuva, he still, um, he still is what essentially brought on or um, ushered in this era of Korbambai Rishon. And so it's, it's an uncomfortable, it's an uncomfortable kind of place to be with Menashe, with these two different perspectives on Shuva, either a real radical acceptance or a complete rejection really of his Shuva. Um, but I want to revisit, and I'm sorry if anyone wants to say something, I'll wrap up quickly and then make time for questions. I want to revisit just that middle piece of the Gemara, um, which really highlights the impact of Menashe's tshuva on the nation. And I think that we are inherently uncomfortable with Menashe's tshuva on a very personal level, right? That his personal tshuva, it's unclear. Should it really be accepted? Shouldn't it? Does he merit a place in the world to come? Doesn't he? Seems to be a real machloket. But for us to take a step back and remember that regardless of whether he was worthy or not, Menashe has a tremendous impact on the actions of other people. He is a king. He is the monarch who rules a large group of people, all of the remnants of Am Yisrael after Galut Shamron. And so what the rabbis say in the middle, because he did not repent and the people followed in his footsteps, meaning that the people follow their king and Menashe's actions really do have impact on other people. And it's possible, potentially, we can think about Menashe's action as Hashem hears his tshuva and lets it creep in. It's possible that Hashem is saying, okay, Menashe, I'm going to give you another chance really to see if your new actions can affect Am Yisrael. And we see that Menashe's actions truly do affect Am Yisrael and he allows B'nai Israel, he has B'nai Israel come back and be zoveach and be, um, and worship in the Mikdash. Even though he did such horrible things, he really does include the people and he allows them, he brings them back. And it reminds me of this concept of, um, that we read about in Barchi Nafshi and on Rosh Chodesh, every Rosh Chodesh, we read this beautiful prayer, Barchi Nafshi. And there's a famous line at the end that's a song. I'm not going to sing it for you, but you can sing it for yourself. Very famous line. Yitamu chata'im in ha'aretz urshayim adenam archinafshi at Hashem hallelujah. The sins will be taken away or will be excised from the earth. And because the sins are taken away, the wicked will be no more. And there's a very famous Gemara in Brachot where Rabbi Meir um, famously, he's watching some like hooligans and they're playing or they're doing bad things. And he says to, uh, to his wife, he says, oh, I'm praying that they should be taken out of the land. I pray that these hooligans should just be killed, taken away. And Bruria, his wife famously says to him, he says, Rabbi Mayer, 
It doesn't say it doesn't say that the sinners should be completely taken out of the land. It says Yitamu Chataim. It says we should try to limit the amount of sin from the land. And then Urshaim Arenam. And then there won't be any more evil in the land. Actually, in the label, it has a similar interpretation when she talks about um, taking away Amalek or destroying Amalek, which is interesting in last week's Parsha, to read at the end of last week's Parsha. But the idea is that Menashe had in his hands an opportunity for Yitamu Chataim to limit or to lessen the amount of Chataim in the land, Min Ha'aret, and so through his actions, through his tshuva, even if it was insincere, even if it was, didn't go all the way, and even though he did some horrible evil things, in the end, he was able to yitamu chata'im. He was able to lessen or to weaken the amount of chata'im in the land. And maybe for that reason, he does merit olam haba even though it's still a difficult concept to wrap our heads around. And so I think for us moving forward to think about how our actions not only impact us as individual people, but how we really um, may impact those around us and how we are really the goal maybe should be Yitamu Chata'i. How can we help lessen the amount of evil in the world, regardless of maybe even who we truly are as people, and that will really bring down the level of evil and the amount of evil in the world. So thank you so much for listening to um, our accounts of Menashe, my accounts of Menashe. I'm going to look in the questions to see if there's any questions or if anyone wants to comment or question um, about our accounts of Menashe and his good or bad shuva. Otherwise, um, it's wonderful to see everybody and I'll see you all in a few weeks. Hey, thank you. I just thought on. Did, did you get all the questions at the end? Oh, let me see. Let me see. Let me yeah, see. I think Sorry. there are a few comments. You oh, I see. I see. I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, see? Okay. Despite Saul says, despite the weak level of Menashe's Shuba, it nevertheless was recognized by Hashem, who even intervened to have it accepted. It wasn't nothing. I do agree, Saul. Absolutely. On account of Menashe, it sounds like the exact opposite of for the merits of our forefathers. Not for the state, not for our sake, for your sake, for the sake of our patriarchs. Kivan, do you mind explaining your comments? If you're still here. Okay. I'm not sure exactly what that means. It sounds like an interesting comment. Okay. No, no. In uh, in in uh, several prayers, uh, um, uh, this phrase occurs that not for our sake, not not for our merits, but for the merits of our ancestors. And uh, in one of your slides, you said uh, uh, on account on of account of, on account of Manasa. So that seemed like the exact opposite of um, uh, being uh, opposite of being rewarded for the merits of our forefathers. Here, it's uh, being punished for the sins of uh, Manasa. Beautiful. I think that's, that's a wonderful comment. And I think that um, there in the times of, I love that you're bringing that up because in the times of Ezra and Nehemia, there was this almost this heaviness, this feeling that we are paying for the sins of our forefathers, that we're the reason we're in this situation, that we have to slept back to Eretz Yisrael, and we have to go through this hardship to rebuild the temple, that we were in exile in the first place was because of people like Menashe. And B'nai Israel kind of carried that burden on their shoulders. And I've seen commentary, I've seen in books written about Ezra and Nehemia, that there's the, the way that Ezra and Nehemia tried to write Debra Hayami is to almost to introduce this aspect of, but it is not, we're not being punished for our forefathers. It is not our fault. It, 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 we are able to move on from their sins. So I like that you brought that up. And I think that that's something that Nasrael during that time, they kind of lived with that idea of on account of Menashe, which as you said, is the opposite of on account of our forefathers. It's a beautiful point. The patriarchs and the kings probably have ability to distribute their merits and shortcomings among generations of people. Um, it's true, right? We do have that tradition that um, 
we benefit from the merits of our forefathers, but we also um, we also suffer because of some of the things that our forefathers did, which is, seems to be true in the way Sefer Malachim is set up. Chaya says, we have few mentions of kings who may have been Mashiach, had they not done or neglected to do seemingly small things. One is Yashiyahu, who did not want to permit Paranacha to pass through our territory, and the other is one who did not sing the Shira. Beautiful. Um, what do you mean we have few mention of those kings? Hi. A few, a few, too. She's I, saying we, a a few. we have a few. Words, right, yeah. which means that there are people whose whole lives may have gone in one direction, and yet something can have messed it up. And so in one way, it can be done in a negative way, that they were worthy of being Mashiach, and yet because, was it Chizkiyahu or yeah. um, mm -hmm. yeah, who, who yeah. did not see yeah. Shira? And Yoshiahu, who thought that the Jews were better than they were, and yes. therefore, whatever. So I'm saying yes. in the same way, Menashe was able to affect a whole lifetime mm -hmm. by even a small action, because it works mm -hmm. both ways, is what I wanted to say. It does work both ways. I think you're absolutely right. And just to mention, Menashe's grandson is Yoshiahu. So even though Amon, his son, was not great, his grandson is Yoshiahu. So something... Maybe, you know, to his credit, not to his credit. Um, something seems to have gotten through. Um, I think that's a, that's a beautiful concept, right? Even a smallest action can kind of tilt the scale in one way or the other and really set history on a completely different course. It's a beautiful comment. My comment regarding differences between writing down and authoring a book was in regards to Baba Batra quote. As there is another tradition as who authored or even if by prophecy versus wrote down certain books. Absolutely, that's true. Um, I don't think that I'm in a place to comment very much on that nuance, meaning authorship versus who wrote down. But we do have a number of places where we see, for example, the last, you know, eight psukim of the Torah, we say the Torah was recorded or written by Moshe, but the last eight psukim of the Torah were written by Yahushua because it was about Moshe's death. So we do have different traditions for authorship versus like the physical act of writing the sefer. Um, so I hope that addresses that comment. Um, how do we explain how do we explain the second part of the verse? Urashaim Odenam, is that the part Tova? I don't know if Toba I, still here. I presume so. If you tell me okay. yeah. what that means, get rid of the evil. And so Urushaim it doesn't Adenam. say Rasha, it says Rishaim, the evildoers. The evildoers, exactly. That's true. I was taking some poetic license and saying that we're getting rid of the evil, but true, it's true. What Bruya is saying is saying, if we take away the Chataim, then there would be no more Rishaim people would no longer actually be evil because they would no longer be doing evil things. This, of course, calls it, brings us a little bit back to our initial problem, which is that, well, we would still probably call Manasseh a Russia, even if at the end of his life, he did enact a Yitamu Chatai, or maybe not. Um, maybe it's more of a, where are you in this time period? Maybe at the end of his life, he's not considered a Russia. I don't know, but I think we do have to interpret it as Bruria did, that the take, getting rid of sins then also helps eradicate the Rishayim, not by killing them, but by changing them from sinners to non-sinners. All right. I mean, has, that, yeah, she gave a brush on the Pasuk. The simple yeah. pshat is like Rav Meir. Rav, Rav yeah, Meir is a simple pshat. Bruria was giving, you know, a uh, whole new interpretation yes. to, to, to a Mayer beautiful says, interpretation, which we everybody loves to quote. You know, that's yeah. uh, you Rev, know. Rev Mayer says you're right because well, maybe it's just because it's his wife, and his wife always has to be right. But either way, <laughs> he he agrees. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Right. We'll see you guess in Thank three you. weeks. I'll Next week, weeks. Jen is going to be talking on Yosef. We remember, these mm -hmm. are four stories in Tanakh and the power of Chuba. So next week, 1 p.m. will be on Yosef. This evening, 8.30 p.m., Mark Shapiro will be talking on Sha'ul Lieberman, uh, unrelated 
to Truva, you know, our, our regular share. Everything's related to Truva. Learning Torah. Right. Everything we do is relating to, but uh, not uh, not in a classical way. And tomorrow morning, Rabbi Adler re-experiencing Rav Soloveitchik's Rosh Hashanah tomorrow at 11 a.m. Then we have uh, Wednesday, Benny Gesundheit, Musings on the Machsor, uh, at 11, and Shofar are discussing the Musa from Rosh Hashanah, always in his creative, uh, ingenious ways. And then they have Torah um, with, with Moshe Sokolov, 8 p.m. on Wednesday night, Thursday, Gil Pearl on the Yud Gil Midor HaRachamim, and then at 8.30 p.m., Rev. Sam, Sam Berkowitz giving the Parsha to Shavu Shir at 8.30, my Shir Pirkei Avot, 9.30. Pirkei Avot is always on Shuvah, I think, even though, again, it's not directly Shuvah, but Pirkei Avot is, is such a beautiful book of, of, of Shuvah. Anyways, that's a, a little plug I normally don't give. And then on Sunday, um, Natty Helfgott is not speaking this Sunday. He's taking a break. You know, he did two weeks. Yona is missing this week, but the YC2 Yomi Yun will continue next week, and Rabbi Leap Tag will be continuing on Safer Dvarim, and then back to Monday morning, and Daniel Reinhold at 11 a.m. before Jennifer's class. Okay, so that gives you the whole week. We look forward to learning with you, as always. I encourage you to invite your friends, and uh, we look forward to seeing you a little bit later. And thank you, Rebecca, and... Uh, Okay. Thank you, everyone. Hope, Wonderful hope, to hope see the you. kids are enjoying enjoying school, so it's a little quiet in the house. You know, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> so, okay. Thank right. you, everybody, and we look forward to learning with you soon. Okay. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.